While grocery shopping the other day, I perused the gamut of the usual gossip magazines that cluttered the checkout stand. I was amazed to find several of them with cover stories on the amazing prophecies of Nostradamus. I thought, how amazing that the world will focus on Nostradamus's predictions, which at best are so nebulous that they are capable of many interpretations. But it did impress me how interested and anxious the average person is to discover what is going on to happen in the future. The tragedy is that the world ignores the ancient prophecies of the prophet Ezekiel that are amazing beyond compare. They pinpoint an exact time, place, and precise historic conditions of a future world catastrophe. Ezekiel names the people and the nations involved in an intricate convergence of history. And he predicted all these things more than 2,600 years ago. This experience motivated me to devote tonight's program to Ezekiel's prophetic enigma. Ezekiel chapters 35 through 39 contain one of the most amazing series of prophecies in the Bible. Certainly, it's more amazing than anything the so-called prophets of the world have to offer. In chapters 36 through 38, Ezekiel foresees the following events. And remember, this must be seen from Ezekiel's perspective of the 7th century B.C. First, the Israelites would be driven from their land for a very long period of time. Second, the Israelites would survive as a distinct people in spite of this dispersion. Three, their land would be confiscated by the surrounding nations. Four, these nations would be descended from Esau and Ishmael, known as Arabs. Five, these people would have a perpetual hatred of the Israelites. Six, the land of Israel would become an utter desolation and not respond to the agricultural efforts of the usurpers. Seven, against all odds, the Israelites would return and become a nation. Eight, the land would miraculously respond to them and flourish. Nine, the Arab nations would conduct an unending war against the Israelites, now known as Israelis. 10. Israel would survive all assaults and prosper. 11. This will finally provoke an assault upon Israel led by the Russians and a Persian-led confederacy of all the surrounding Muslim nations. The most important element of this prophecy is when it will take place. Ezekiel carefully pinpoints the time. He wrote, After many days you will be summoned. In the latter years you will come into the land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. But its people were brought out from the nations, and they're living securely, all of them. Note that when Ezekiel made this prediction, Israel had not been scattered throughout all the nations. Its land had not been reduced to a continual waste. Its people had not been brought back to the land from very long worldwide dispersion. It was not the last days, and Israel by no means was restored to the land to dwell securely. Historically, this can only apply to the events that began to take place in the early 20th century and culminated with the creation of the State of Israel in May 1948. Moses first predicted this would happen. He foresaw that it would occur following the second destruction of the nation. The first was the Babylonian Holocaust. The second was the Roman Holocaust of Titus and the Roman 10th Legion in AD 70. Moses predicted both the Babylonian and the Roman dispersions and about the second destruction, Moses forewarned, Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. There you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which your fathers have not known. Among those nations you shall find no rest, and there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes, and despair of soul. So your life shall hang in doubt before you, and you will be in dread night and day. 
and shall have no assurance of your life. In the morning you shall say, Would that it were evening. And in evening you will say, Would that it were morning. Because of the dread of your heart, which you shall dread. And for the sight of your eyes, which you will see. Now all of this is later assumed by Ezekiel's prophecy in chapters 36 through 39. You know, one of the most amazing wonders concerning the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is that they could remain a distinct people in spite of centuries of exile and relentless persecution. Ezekiel clearly predicts that God would scatter them among all the nations. He wrote, I also scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the lands. According to their ways and their deeds, I judged them. Yet, he predicts that in the latter days, God would gather them from all nations. He said, For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Ezekiel then issues a warning to the surrounding nations of Arab people who confiscated God's land. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and to the hills, to the ravines and to the valleys, to the desolate wastes and to the forsaken cities which have become a prey and a derision to the rest of the nations which are round about. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom who appropriated my land for themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and with scorn of soul to drive it out for a prey. Ezekiel also forewarns the Arab people of the last days who would confiscate Israel's land. He says, Because you have said these two nations and these two lands, Israel and Judah, will be mine, and we will possess them, although the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, I will deal with you according to your anger and according to your envy, which you showed because of your hatred against them. So I will make myself known among them when I judge you. The whole world has been drawn into this ancient conflict. No one has been able to resolve it because of the supernatural hatred that has been enshrined in the Muslim religion toward the Jews. When Ezekiel made these predictions, Israel was not an utter desolation, but he foresaw the terrible desolation that would come upon the land during the centuries the Israelites would be scattered among the nations. Ezekiel refers to this desolation when he predicts Israel's restoration to the land. He wrote, After many days you will be summoned. In the latter years you will come into the land that is restored from the sword whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste, but his people were brought out from the nations. After touring the land of Israel in 1867, Samuel Clement, better known as Mark Twain, wrote in his book, Innocence Abroad, it is a desolate country whose soil is rich enough but is given over wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life and action. We never saw a human being on the whole route. There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of the worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. This was the condition of the land until the Jews began to return around the end of the 19th century. When the British Christians began to press for what became the Balfour Declaration, they argued for returning the Jews to Palestine by saying, a people without a land for a land without a people. That is how desolate and barren it was. This process culminated with the League of Nations voting to give Israel a homeland including all of Biblical Israel and Jerusalem. At the San Remo Conference on July 24, 1922, it was passed. I'll be back in a moment. Ezekiel predicted the Israelites would miraculously begin to return and become a nation again in the last days. God made it clear that he would do this despite the fact that the Israelites did not deserve it. 
God said he would do this for his own great name's sake. He swore on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would establish David's throne and kingdom on earth. So his word is at stake. Now this is why God said, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. Almost as great a miracle as the return of the people scattered throughout the world for 2,000 years and the rebirth of a nation is the agricultural rebirth of land. Yet Ezekiel predicted this would happen. He wrote, But you, O mountains of Israel, you will put forth your branches and bear your fruit for my people Israel, for they will soon come home. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn you, and you will be cultivated and sown. None of the people who occupied the land during Israel's exile could ever make it productive. But when the Israelites returned, it became a modern agricultural miracle. Today, fruits and vegetables from Israel supply most of Europe. The Arab-Israeli conflict today, framed as the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, continues to upset the whole world. The world's great powers have sought to resolve the conflict without success. Realistically, the world's economy depends on a steady flow of oil, and since most of the world's oil supply is in control by the Arab Muslim nations, whatever troubles the Arabs troubles the world, and Israel troubles